my name is Tori Lupinek, and you are listening to The Unclassical Musician, the podcast empowering the new generation of classical musicians to take risks and live a fulfilling life. Each week, we dive in headfirst into a topic on the minds of young professional musicians and come out the other side with a new perspective on life as an artist. Hello, unclassical musicians. I literally just got off of my Zoom call with Jess Voigt Page, musician success and business coach for millennials. And I have to say, we had a great time. We got serious, but we also had fun. And there are so many little gold nuggets sprinkled throughout this conversation for you. Um, I'm really excited for you to hear it. For those of you who don't know Jess Voigt Page, um, she is a saxophonist extraordinaire based in Austin, Texas. She's originally from Australia, so you're welcome. You get to listen to an Australian accent for an hour today. I hope you enjoy it because <laughs> I enjoy talking to her. Um, so Jess is a classical saxophonist, teacher, performer, and musician success and business coach. She is on faculty at Baylor University where she teaches music business and music entrepreneurship for the students there. She's also the president-elect of NASA, which I know I'm in Houston, but we are not talking about the space agency. Um, if you're not a saxophonist, NASA stands for the North American Saxophone Alliance. It's also very cool and kind of a big deal, but it's not going out into outer space. We're not taking saxophones into outer space right now. Jess's three-ish minute Thursday YouTube videos cover a variety of bite-sized topics pertinent to creating your own music career. I definitely suggest that you check those out. They're anywhere between three and five minutes long, but they're all bite-sized little nuggets. I met Jess on Instagram a few months ago. Are you seeing a pattern here yet with meeting awesome people on Instagram? And I have found her content to be super helpful in getting me to think more critically about how I am running my own small business of being a musician in the 21st century. Also, fun fact, Jess made a pavlova over the winter holidays, which if you don't know what a pavlova is, it's a beautiful light meringue and fruit dessert that originated in Australia. And the Nancy Burt Whistle, winner of Great British Bake Off Series 5, commented on Jess's pick of her pavlova, I quote, beautiful. And she also shared it in her stories. So if you love Great British Bake Off as much as I do, that's a huge deal. And if you want to have the deets on that, make sure you listen all the way to the end of the episode because we talk about it at the end. Uh, before I turn you loose with this conversation today, I real quick wanted to remind you that The Unclassical Musician is now on Patreon. I'm still super excited about that. And it's a new month, so things are going on there. Um, if you enjoy The Unclassical Musician to any extent, if you like the solo ranting episodes, or if you like the interview slash conversational episodes, and you want to make sure that this content keeps getting put out every week for your ears and listening enjoyment, the easiest and best way for you to do that is to go over to patreon.com. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash the unclassical musician. 
And if you sign up there, you will be a part of our exclusive online Patreon community. And you can contribute anywhere from 5 to $20 per month to cover the costs of me producing this episode every week and to make sure that you are still getting access to this information from really some of the um, brightest millennial musicians on the internet right now. And I have to say on the internet because that's the only way we're doing this, right? So if you have even $5 per month and you would like to support the show, head on over to Patreon and you'll get billed on the first of the next month. So it's February right now. So if you sign up today, you won't get billed until March 1st, for example. And with that... I hope you enjoy our conversation today. Here's Jess Voigt Page. Hi, are. Jess. Hi. <laughs> How are you? Good. How are you doing? I'm good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Happy Friday. Yeah, likewise. Is that a better sound? I just turned on original sound. I can turn it off if that's... I think it sounds not fine. Awesome. Okay, awesome. Yeah. Yeah, I've got my mic set up, so hopefully that's fine. If it does get too noisy, just let me know and I can turn off that original sound too. Okay, cool. Thanks. Same on my end. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so Sounds I want to say thank you so much for agreeing to come on the show. I super appreciate you and your time. Of course. Of I'm course. very happy that you're here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm excited to be here. This is going to be fun. Cool. Um, so I would love to start off with just so that the people who don't know who you are, who are listening, can kind of get an idea of who you are and what you do. If you could give a little spiel and maybe tell the people what you've been doing the last 11 months during the pandemic to keep you busy. <laughs> 11 months. Good grief. Yeah, um, yeah absolutely. So um, my name is Jess Boyd Page, and I'm um, an Australian who lives in Texas now, so you might catch a little bit of, a, of an accent going on in there. Um, but I do a whole bunch of different things. So I'm a saxophonist by like musician trade. <laughs> um, I'm also an educator and a coach for musicians for businesses and career um, development. And so I actually work on faculty at Baylor University where I teach saxophone and music entrepreneurship. And I teach uh, arts entrepreneurship at UT Austin here in Austin as well. Um, on top of all of that, I am the founder and owner of Saxophone Academy Austin, which has been my teaching business that I've had since 2014 here in, in Austin. And uh, I also run the Longhorn Music Camps program at UT. So <laughs> lots of different things. Um, and then, of course, all of that is um, on top of my work as a coach uh, for musicians who are looking to start their own businesses or build their careers in lots and lots of different ways. So it's exciting and a lot of, uh, a lot of fun and it's pretty uh, enjoyable to be able to reach people in so many different ways through my career. Wow. You sound super busy actually. <laughs> That's great though. It's, yeah. It's, it's busy, but it's, um, you know, it, like I said, it, it's super inspiring and really encouraging to be able to reach musicians at different points in their, in their career journeys. That's something that I've, been fascinated with for a long time is how do musicians design careers and how do we, um, you know, how do we position ourselves to really create success in our lives in ways that are traditional and non-traditional. And I love, you know, the unclassical musician is obviously digging into some of the, the less traditional models for career development and, and um, like building our lives out as musicians. So, you know, this is my jam. <laughs> So glad that you're here again. <laughs> so you were saying that you like seeing musicians at like different stages in their career. So like right now, what are like the youngest students that you see or the youngest people that you work with? Is it your college students or do you see high schoolers for the summer camp or? Yeah, I have high schoolers. I actually have some high schoolers in um, like through my Saxburn Academy, kind of the weekly lesson situation as well. So I actually do have, I think my youngest student now is in seventh grade. Oh. So I have, yeah, a range of students from seventh grade all through grad school. Uh, we have some master's saxophone students at Baylor who are, you know, navigating their own journeys and paths and getting ready for auditions or for jumping out into into the world as, you know, freelance artists or working in arts admin and all of that good stuff. So it's it's like the whole, you know, range <laughs> of, yeah. of different positions for people. And it's it's really cool to, to see what people are passionate about and 
to kind of help them, guide them in that direction, whether it's that they want to stay in music, um, you know, after high school or not, or if they're looking to dig into different facets of, um, you know, musical careers beyond even graduate school. So Mm -hmm. have you, are you at the point now in your career where you have had a seventh grader and you've like trained them all the way up through a senior in high school and then they've gone on to music school? Have you done that yet? Not quite a seventh grader. I've got someone currently who's a junior and I started with her when she was beginning. So that's, that's pretty fun to see. And we were just talking about that yesterday, actually. (laughs) How how funny it is. I can't believe she's a junior because she's still a seventh grader in my mind, but. Yeah. Oh, that's so cute. Wow. So you are pretty much like the definition of a portfolio career then as a musician, wouldn't you say? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, (laughs) The, the old saying of variety is the spice of life. I'm pretty sure I live by that. Um, I have always been interested in having multiple streams of income for stability's sake. Um, this has been something that's been really important to me as a musician and as someone who is trying to kind of define my own version of success and define my own version of my career. Having the ability to have multiple income streams means that I have the flexibility and the creativity to pursue things that I want to pursue. And that's always been something that's been very important to me ever since probably even in high school when I was, you know, starting in my first jobs and things, I I always wanted to have not just one main source of income. And honestly, I can tell you, like, to jump back to that first question about, you know, what um, things, what we've been doing in the pandemic and what's been going on for the last 11 months, like, I have never been more convinced that having that ability to have the multiple streams of income is critical for musicians who are really looking to redefine their own futures because we can't rely on other people to be in charge of that for us and I've had a number of times there have been a number of times I should say that I've really been burned by relying on people to uh to do the right thing by me in terms of my income Mm. and uh you know from positions at you know colleges or from being hired by employers like something this is probably getting way off track but like I've been fired a number of times from different jobs for no reasons other than like I think one time I got fired for having bronchitis and what? <laughs> yeah and I, it was a, a wait a waiting job like I was a, a waiter at a restaurant but they fired me for having bronchitis because I couldn't show up for my shift and I was like oh. I'm literally in the hospital like <laughs> That's I'm rude. sorry I can't be there Jeez. but through through those types of, of things like you kind of learn okay everybody has their own agenda for how they're going to pay people and employ people and do all of that. So if I really want to be able to take control of my own financial life or my own career, I also need to be the one kind of dictating those terms for myself. And so for me, having that multiple income streams kind of gives me a little bit of a safety net if something happens with one of, you know, one of my things. (laughs) Oh yeah, for sure. I feel so bad for the very, very many, um, people who rely on strictly just performing for their income. Mm-hmm. Like, yes, they're living the dream, you know, that so many of us have had. But in this pandemic, it's just like to see so many of them, number one, just depressed because they are not performing and not doing the work that they really love to do. But also like severe pay cuts because right. they had no other form of income they didn't diversify their income streams at all and as a musician like I kind of realized maybe like halfway through undergrad that um I knew I wasn't going to be happy just doing one thing like maybe I have a little ADD in that respect like if I was doing the same thing like five days a week or six days a week you know Like, I think I would eventually be bored of that and, like, need to have something else to do, too. Totally. You know? Yeah, totally. In a sense, just, like, keeping yourself sharp as a musician and, like, having other skills that you're good at besides just the one thing makes you more marketable and more profitable in the end. Yeah. Well, and I think a lot of that comes down to, like, also just trusting the, the whole thing of, like, you can define your career or your future or your life however you want it to be. Like you can design all of that for yourself if you give yourself the permission to actually explore those possibilities. And so I remember back in 2015 when I first 
No, I'd started my business here in Austin. I've, I've run teaching studios for, I guess, since 2007 was my first one in Australia. And so it's been something I've been doing for a long time. And in 2014, I got to this place where I was doing okay. Um, things were fine, but I was just kind of like, there has to be more than just showing up and getting paid each lesson mm-hmm. or, you know, kind of that, um, the repetition of just like, this is how this is going to be for the next 30 years of my life. Like really? <laughs> And I remember kind of reaching a point in 2015 where, uh, you know, I was kind of sitting on my bed crying, being like, I got to figure this out. Something has to change because this is not what I envisioned my life to be. And um, that was where I really started exploring entrepreneurship as a facet of my career as an artist and digging into like understanding more about the entrepreneurial mindset and developing business skills and and really experimenting with that in my own business to see what would happen if, you know, what if I mixed things up and started doing this my own way instead of the way that other people are doing it around me? Or, you know, what if I just changed the model a little bit? Or what if I, you know, learned this element of, of marketing and like reached out to people this way or created this new offering based off of something that I was identifying that seemed unusual and kind of crazy to other people at the time? Like I, I spent a good year or so really digging into experimenting with facets of that of the entrepreneurial um, mindset in my own life and business and realized that it changed everything um but there was a solid six months of that where I was afraid to even tell my husband that I was learning about this stuff I was like so I was so embarrassed I was like Mm -hmm. I'm a musician I shouldn't be looking at these other things like I like I had all of those thoughts of like I'm selling out if I'm interested in something else or Um, you know, if I pursue this other avenue where I actually step into the role of the business person or I pursue these personal development things, like, does that make me less of a musician? And it got to the point when I was, you know, I wanted to, and I, I I guess I didn't at the time, but I wanted to like ask people, will you still like me if I'm not a musician or if I'm not like the performing musician Mm -hmm. because of that, uh, that mindset of, um, this was not what I was trained to be thinking about, but also that disconnected, but this is what I want to be pursuing and exploring because this is, this is where I'm interested in addition to my music. And so it was really this interesting time period of discovering the fact that I could be a musician and, Mm -hmm. and that's been something that has completely changed my, my life is actually embracing the end part of being a musician embracing the and Mm -hmm. yes and it's not something like you're not man especially being like from a very good um educational academic academia background Mm -hmm. that feeling that if you have not made it in that area that doing anything else is a cop-out right rather than something that's actually good for the creative half of your brain and like you can actually make money doing it too right yeah totally and I think that it's important to note for the listeners that you that your husband is also a musician so it's not that you yeah Yeah, (laughs) weren't talking to your husband about it he's also a saxophonist he is yeah he's he's a he's the saxophone professor here at UT Austin so we're a saxophone heavy family (laughs) oh my gosh does your cat play saxophone too no (laughs) no they one of them does like to sit in our cases, though, so maybe that's oh, a thing. That's cute. <laughs> um, yeah. So, question: When you um, realized that you were done trading dollars for saxophone lessons, were you like deeply in the Texas private lesson teaching world at that point? It was in my first year here. Yeah. Um, so, and and I've been like I said, I've been teaching uh, lessons you know, in Australia and things prior to. And so I had a lot of experience with what that looked like in Australia and not necessarily in the U S I'd been teaching in Colorado when we lived there. Um, but there was a whole time period where I wasn't allowed to do anything because I didn't have a green card. Well, I had a green card, but it was in process. So I wasn't allowed to work. Oh, no. Um, <laughs> this is whole thing, but you no, know, coming to Texas just blew my mind because it was a lot more similar to what I was used to in Australia than what I'd seen in Colorado. Okay having the, the lessons in school time and doing all of that. And that's what I grew up with personally. Um, but then add to that the, the competitive nature of marching band and 
you know, the solo and ensemble stuff and the all state stuff, which I'd never even heard of. There was so much, um, that it was really inspiring to see how high, uh, high of a level the students were. But I also developed pretty quickly this idea of if I was a student in high school in Texas, I probably would not be like, I wouldn't have stayed in music myself. Mm, Um, and so that became a really big driving force for me of how can I create opportunities for students to, to really dig into the enjoyment of music in addition to all of the work that they're having to do with the competitive side of it. And that's where we started like the summer camps that I do and, um, having masterclasses and, um, digging into some of those other things where my motto was, it's fun to be good. So Mm -hmm. it encourages students to continue to grow as musicians and to learn, but to also then realize that that opens so many more doors for enjoyable opportunities. And that was something that's always been important to me and something that I felt was some, was like I could bring that and that was different. So that was a lot of what I started really looking into as to, okay, yeah, there is still going to be that traditional model for lessons here in the, here in Texas of parents are trained to pay for lessons per hour. Mm -hmm. How can I then change that for, you know, in terms of my own lesson structures, like how can I fix it so that I'm not unsure of my budget every month? How can I make it consistent for them? So looking into more of the lesson packages, still saying it's this per hour, but for this many lessons, um, and then looking at what else could I do to support the students beyond that, you know, old school way it's always been done kind of thinking. Right. Yeah. I do like that though, saying it's fun to be good. Because yeah. it is fun to be good. And, like, I've, I've told kids before and, like, they experience for themselves. Like, when you like how you sound and when it feels easy, then practicing is easy. And you'll just keep practicing yeah. for hours, yeah. you know. And when you're doing that, you're getting better. Yep. And it's just. Well, it's, it's that the thing that we talk about with motivation, right? This is the mm-hmm. same thing with our careers as, um, as adults. Like, even after we've graduated, people are like, I don't know how to get motivated. And it's like. The motivation isn't the thing that starts. <laughs> motivation doesn't come first. It comes from being in action mm. and from taking that first step and from actually building up that momentum. And so just like it's fun to be good as a student, it's also fun to to have that you know momentum building as a professional or as someone building your career by taking these small steps forward because then you're going to take larger steps later on and then you're going to experience greater growth and greater you know trajectory towards that success model that you're looking for so I also see that with when I'm working with people and they're starting to generate like little bits of income that little bit of income above what they started off with turns very quickly into quite a bit more Mm -hmm. and then they're like oh this is really fun like I can do this I can I can take my ideas and turn it into something that I can make income off which then means that I can create more ideas and create more benefit and more value for other people and then, then there's this like really cool exchange of value going constantly and that's really motivating. Um, yeah, it's, that's very, it's, it's the exact same thing as it's fun to be good, you know? Right. Yeah. <laughs> that's yeah, really that's, cool. Maybe that's my life motto after all. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which is cool. I mean, I might adopt that. I had never, like, I mean, sure, I've said it to my students, but saying it to my students and actually living it myself are like two different things, as mm-hmm. we know sometimes. <laughs> but um, so at one point, so when you, decided that you were going to start looking into the more like entrepreneurial realm within music Mm -hmm. at what at what point did you discover or decide that you wanted to start coaching other people in their own music careers yeah it's been an ongoing process probably I think five or six years now I've been actually coaching musicians in building ventures and businesses and helping them kind of reassess the way that they're functioning within the things that they already have. So within their own built, like their own teaching studios or their own um, organizations and things like that's been something I've been doing for five or six years now. Um, Kind of on an, on a ad hoc Mm -hmm. (laughs) basis, I suppose. But what I realized when I was experimenting with everything myself, um, it was very easy to generate change for my own career and for my own business and my own life not just from the standpoint of I could make more money, but from a standpoint of, oh, I feel empowered myself to actually take charge. Um, And so what I realized was that, well, I guess I got frustrated that I hadn't been taught that in school Mm -hmm. and that there wasn't any discussion of it and that, 
you know, that six months where I was embarrassed to even talk to my husband about it. I was like, why am I embarrassed about this? Because this is me realizing that, again, realizing the end, right? Um, I can be a musician and do all these other things. And so I was really, you know, started out thinking like, what can I do to help support other people have these realizations for themselves? And that started around 2016. So yeah, we're looking at five years um, at this point because I wanted to empower other musicians to not have to feel like they have to leave the field in order to generate income that they could support themselves off of. And I've had so many colleagues and friends, uh, you know, I'm 32. <laughs> I'm saying I'm not afraid to talk, to talk about my age. Um, <laughs> but so I'm, I'm in my early thirties now and my friends and my colleagues and people that I've admired as musicians in my age bracket for many years, I see them leaving. They hit that mm -hmm. burnout and they leave our field. And I always ask them why. And, you know, in a polite way, like I'm not like judging you. I'm like, mm -hmm. I'm just really curious because this is important to me to understand the root cause of why people are leaving our field and why people are leaving our industry so that it's not just me speculating. And more often than not, it's that they aren't able to make the money they need to make to like to have a sustainable lifestyle. Mm -hmm. um, or they aren't feeling respected by the people that are controlling the paychecks. Mm. And so there's this really challenging imbalance of people want autonomy and respect, and they also want to be able to create a life that they can enjoy. And it's sad to me that that's not possible for so many people. Yeah. And I guess that's what triggered me to go, okay, well, I know that the things that I have put into place for myself work for me. And if I can help other people using those skill sets and, and helping them understand that the power of entrepreneurship and, um, you know, taking control, I think it sounds so, um, like taking control sounds so aggressive, but it really is like grab your career and grab your life and be the person that makes the decisions for you. Mm -hmm. Don't wait for something to come. Um, and don't rely on other people to make your, career the thing you want it to be like you just can't wait so long story short I guess with all of that is that the trigger point for me was that I felt so many people were leaving for reasons that were they seemed kind of dumb reasons like mm -hmm. don't give up on your dream because you can't you know or you shouldn't have to give up on your dream because you can't afford it yeah Mm -hmm. there should be something that we're taught or that we're trained or that we're, you know, we should have the ability to generate the income that we need to, to actually create our careers and create our lives the way that we want them to be. And so, you know, I've been working for years to, to try to bring these things to universities and to, you know, I apply for every job under the sun mm -hmm. <laughs> that has anything to do with any of these things. And um, what I've found to be quite disappointing is the, the lack of real commitment to career development and entrepreneurship and business skill set development in universities. Oh, seriously? Like, man, I mean, I know it's at this point, it's not surprising, but mm -hmm. I do hope, I mean, like you teach those kind of courses at two different schools, mm -hmm. which is great. And my undergrad, we did have like a music, on, we had a music entrepreneurship course, and then we had a music business from the performer's perspective course. Mm -hmm. And not they weren't required. I don't think they were required, but a lot of us did take them, you know. But like at DePaul, we do quarters, not semesters. So it's only right. a 10 week course. That's a very, very, very small fraction right. of your entire time at a four year university or college or conservatory program, you know? Yeah. And I really hope that, I mean, the pandemic has been like terrible, obviously for so many people, mm -hmm. but if anything, this has to reframe how administrations view producing musicians that are actually going to stick with it for the entirety of their careers and keep making art and keep making the world a better place, which, you know, like at the end of the day, like that's part of why we do what we do. You know? Right. Well, and there are some great programs. Like there are definitely programs out there that do a lot of this stuff really well. And they're usually the programs that have a dedicated faculty member and team 
on faculty to actually do that and to like that is their priority and that's their main uh you know their main focus and that the work that they do is to create these programs um and to serve the students in that way on a full-time basis i think one of the big challenges with a lot of uh the way that this stuff is handled is that because you're relying on people who are either on staff or on on faculty to add to their already really busy load Mm -hmm it kind of takes a back burner. And whilst it's helpful to have those courses and, and things in the curriculum, it's when it's an add-on to someone else's duties, it doesn't serve the same purpose as when it's someone's dedicated role. Right, yeah. And that's a big thing that I think a lot of a lot of institutions could change or could really look at if they wanted to really address this and say, okay, we're going to have a specialist in this because, you know, it doesn't have to be... I think some people are afraid that if they take studies in entrepreneurship or in business or in you know any other facet that's an add-on that it's going to reduce their focus on being like a really high quality high high functioning musician themselves Mm -hmm. like they worry that it's going to take away from the musician's ability to be a musician but again musician and it doesn't have to be one or the other it can actually be both and really it should be because there's i mean if you think of i always think about like Who are some of the big musicians that I admire in the world or big artists or people who just in general that I admire? Yeah, they're all specialists in something, but that something is not, you know, it's not an island. (laughs) That that high level uh, element is supported by so many other more general broad skill sets because they have to do all the work to get them to that place where they can rely on the one thing to get them, you know, to be known as that specialist, if that makes sense. Yes. It's never just one skill set for anyone. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, and so I think that if we if we don't encourage the the end, if we don't encourage the development of these other skill sets and mindsets and focuses in addition to the performing musician elements, then we're actually doing our students a huge disservice because we're only setting them up to achieve one thing, and that is to be good in a practice room or on stage. Mm-hmm. Not to then take those skill sets and transform into, you know, something more sustainable. Right. So your job as a music business, like, career coach. Mm-hmm. So I don't want to say that you as a coach and your, like, one-on-one sessions is, like, replacing what would be a broader um, entrepreneurship program at Mm -hmm. a four-year university or in grad school. But that is kind of essentially what you're doing. You're like supplementing what we should have had more hands-on experience with in school and just bringing adults into the real world about (laughs) making money for yourself as an independent musician. Yeah, and I think about a lot of the, um, like, bridging the gap. Mm Mm-hmm going from what do you know where are you like what is it that you are aware of and what what is it that you know and what is it that you want and then let me help bridge that gap from where you are now to where you want to be there are things that we can do to to help you move towards that end goal and if that is in the realm of you know starting a small business or starting an organization or um you know I do a lot of career coaching as well with things like job you know materials like cvs and resumes and cover letters and all of that like reviewing that because i also love copywriting and content and like actually writing Mm -hmm. um so you know if there is something in in that place where i can help to fill that or to to bridge that gap from where you are to where you want to be um that's where i really jump in and and help support people in that journey and um you know when people come to me it's usually they have an idea that a lot of the time they've also just never been confident enough to say what that idea is out loud. Mm -hmm. They're afraid to be like, I want to do this or I want to start. I have this idea. Is it dumb? (laughs) (laughs) My answer is like, no. (laughs) Um, But, you know, it's almost like the first stage is giving them that permission to really explore the possibilities of what that idea could look like for them. And then if it's something that they want to pursue, it's okay, let's talk about how we can work together to, to help you like I think of it as the yellow brick road I always talk about this like (laughs) we know what the emerald city is now because we've discovered what that goal is let's design that yellow brick road and and help you get there so So, it is yeah taking people from one place to the next 
So in that sense, it's like pretty much everyone who's listening to this podcast right now would benefit from some level of coaching if they don't have a 100% plan on how to get to the Emerald City. <laughs> well, I think, yeah, I mean, there are lots of different types of coaches, of course, as I'm sure you know, and I know that a lot of people know. Um, but I think the yeah, if you have a dream that you're wanting to pursue and you don't know how to get there, then potentially like reaching out to a coach or reaching out to someone who has pursued that goal or something similar, you know, that's going to help. So yeah. if that is a formal coaching agreement or a formal coaching arrangement, then that's fantastic because you're working with someone who has an expertise or experience in actually t guiding people through that process. And so you know that they can then accelerate that process for you. And just like you would with a teacher of your instrument, like I studied with saxophone professors because I wanted to accelerate my growth on the saxophone and I wanted someone to help me become a better musician when I didn't yet know the steps to do that. Right. Mm -hmm. It's a similar process for, for coaches. Like if you have that goal in mind that you want to achieve, then as a coach, that's my job to help you get there through like helping you identify those things and setting up plans and setting up structures and keeping you, you know, accountable to those goals. Cause I think that's a big one too, is helping fight through some of the things like the imposter syndrome and scarcity mindset and all of those limitations we put on ourselves, you know, that coach becomes a, an accountability partner, but also like a cheerleader and a support squad and all of that good stuff. So, you know, I find for me with my coaching, it's, it's a mix of strategy and, kind of lifestyle coaching too or life coaching a little bit I'm not a life coach but it is kind of mixing the 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 skill set development with the mindset development mm -hmm. I do think that the accountability is actually probably one of the most important <laughs> items because mm -hmm. yeah. I know like as someone like when we're not in school anymore and we don't have deadlines to be making and we don't have a lesson every week yep. like the only Thing can be keeping you accountable is yourself and if you have a hard time doing that then it's better to like have a, an accountability buddy that can just like make sure that you're like staying on track every week yeah. and like making those goals getting closer to what you're actually striving for yeah and it's so easy to let ourselves off the hook oh yeah <laughs> it's so easy to be like you know what I'm actually you know I know that I said I wasn't comfortable in this place but actually I maybe am um, yeah. <laughs> you know, today I'm really comfortable just being in this place where, you know, it's okay if I sit on the couch all day, like I'm comfortable with that today, even though I know that that means that I'm going to, you know, you, you, you're able to make those mental sacrifices that right. honestly don't make sense if you say them out loud, but in the moment you kind of, you allow that to happen. So having a coach, uh, does really help that because, you know, my, my clients, um, we use WhatsApp and they'll text me and they're like, I'm having a moment. I'm like, okay, get off the couch. Let's do this thing. Like <laughs> <laughs> cheerleader. Yeah. Basically Coach and being, cheerleader. <laughs> you got this, you know, just take that one step or, you know, it, a lot of it is breaking down the big overwhelming goals into really small actionable steps. So that again, building that momentum, like if you take one tiny little step forward, the next one feels less difficult. And the next one feels less difficult that all of a sudden you've done like 10 steps. Right. So that's again, like building on the momentum, like what you were mm -hmm. talking about earlier. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So important. So, um, since you've been doing this for a little while, mm -hmm. what are the three most important things that you would tell someone who is trying to bridge that gap from being a student to getting down to the Emerald city? What are the three most important mm -hmm. things that they should be doing for their entrepreneurial side of their music business, like today, like what can they do today? Yeah. I think that the very first thing is to actually sit. I think of Alexis Rose is to like get in touch with myself, like get, mm -hmm. get to know myself a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so I think really focusing in on identifying specifically what it is that you actually want, not just like the general thing of like, I want a career in blah, blah, blah. Or like, I want to make this amount of money, but like specifically, what is it that you want and why? It's, it's so important to understand the reason behind why you want to do something you know, because that's going to keep you motivated and that's going to help you actually push towards that end target. Mm -hmm. And so setting uh, random goals that mean nothing are not going to help. So 
I think really the first thing is to really reflect internally and say like, who am I? What's important to me? And then what are the goals for my life that come from that? We have to know that for ourselves because again, like it's no one else's responsibility to design our lives for us. Mm -hmm. It's literally ours. Like no one else can do that. We have to design our own lives for ourselves. And so in order to do anything, you have to know what that's going to look like. So, you know, that first step would be setting kind of 12 month goals, 90 day goals, 30 day goals, like just thinking about what do I actually want to achieve so that you have the end point in mind. Just like you wouldn't go on a road trip without a map or without even knowing what the destination is. Like, you're not just going to get in the car and be like, I'm just going to drive somewhere. And then. I mean, some people do, but. (laughs) Yeah, I I don't function like that. No, me neither. (laughs) I have so much anxiety about where are we going? I even have to like, I pre-order in my mind at restaurants. Like I'll look up the menu before we go to the restaurant. Oh yeah. Same. (laughs) That's that's me. Um, But yeah. So like, if you don't know what you're aiming for, you aren't going to get anywhere. Right. Um, so that's the very first thing is to actually sit down and go, okay, what do I want and why? And then the second thing um, that you can do from that is to go, okay, what do I need to do to get there? Like, do I need to develop some new skills? Do I need to work with someone who can help me? Do I need to change where I live? Do I need to, like, what are the practical things that I have to do in order to reach those goals? Because sometimes they're not at all what you think they would be. And you might surprise yourself to realize that, oh, I'm not in the right place for this goal to happen. Hmm. Um, or I'm not with the right people for this goal to be to happen. Or, you know, I don't have as much knowledge about this as I thought. Or, you know, different things come up. So, again, looking at where you want to go and then figuring out, like, what am I going to need in order to get there? Mm-hmm. Um, which sounds kind of like, it doesn't sound like it's a practical thing to do, but we skip over these steps. So, so often we end up just trying to like do everything and get so distracted by the doing of everything that we miss out on the reason behind the doing of the things. And then we just feel busy all the time because we're just kind of throwing everything at the wall, hoping something sticks. Mm. And then if something does stick, we're like, well, Oh, now what? (laughs) (laughs) So really having that, that core knowledge of what it is that you want and, and like what you have to do to get there are going to be the two biggest things you can do to help set yourself onto that, that great path for yourself. And it's not wasted time at all. I think we worry that doing that is wasting time, but actually it's not. It's going to make your process more efficient in the long term. And then the third thing would be that people should just get started. Don't wait until you're, quote, ready Mm -hmm. to start something or to feel like you have everything in place. Just get started. The, The first step is always going to be the hardest because it's the first step. Um, But again, once you do that first step, the second step becomes easier. The next step is going to reveal itself after that. And you can pivot and change and grow and you can answer questions along the way, or you can discover, Oh, I don't want to do that in the, you know, turns out that's not a thing I want to do. Well, that's great to know rather than Mm -hmm. thinking about it for the rest of your life, wondering whether or not that's a thing you wanted to do. Right. So I think one of my favorite people, Marie Folio talks about just starting before you're ready. And that I think is one of the biggest things that you can do if you're trying to, generate anything in life just start Mm -hmm. before you're ready yeah oh I as a perfectionist you know and like so many musicians are perfectionists because that's what Mm -hmm. we've been trained to do it can be very hard to just get yourself to start something when you know that you don't feel 100% ready or it's not 100% perfect yet and if it's not 100% perfect then oh what if it flops you know Mm -hmm. um but if you wait until it's 100% perfect or 100% ready then those are days that you've been missing out on other opportunities to like keep it going and keep it growing you know yeah I love to think of the I mean again it's a it's kind of a cliche but like fail early and fail often Mm. If you think about anyone in any industry who's done amazing things, like they fail things all the time. We just don't know about it because no one cares if you fail. Right. <laughs> <laughs> like no one actually cares when you've, when you've gone through these, these processes of things not working and not, not succeeding when something does, it's because you've learned so many lessons from the stuff that didn't. 
that you know you set it up to to succeed and then no one cares about what happened before then right like it's it's just I think we get in our heads about it because like you said everything feels so high stakes in school Mm -hmm. or as musicians like I remember being told like you know something I don't remember the exact words but Treat every performance as if it's your last. Yeah, like what? Oh my god! <laughs> I'm like, who's telling oh eighteen year olds this? <laughs> like, and like, I geez. understand the sentiment. The sentiment being like, do your best, mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and like, take everything seriously in the moment, and that's important. But like, that pressure of treat everything as if it's the last time you'll do something. Like, oh my goodness, it's it's a lot. And when we transition that into something like a business or a venture or a project, if we think, well, if this doesn't work, it's going to be the last time I succeed at anything. Mm -hmm. Why in the world would you even start? Yeah. That's, that's the mentality that we set ourselves up with is, well, if I know it's probably not going to work, then I just won't put everything in. And then I can't be surprised when it doesn't work. Oh, that just sounds like that makes me sad just hearing that. But I know that I have done that with things in the past. Mm -hmm. You know, if I don't put my 100% into it, then I didn't lose 100% of the stuff I put into it when it fails. Right, exactly. And then you, Assuming you it's going to fail. You give yourself that excuse or that, mm-hmm. that out of like, well, of course it didn't work. I didn't try 100%. If I'd put in 100%, it would have been fine. Like, no, no big deal. Right. But, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I, I didn't, so I can't be... Yeah, it's it's crazy, and it's it's totally a thing when it comes to... Um, our careers and when it comes to entrepreneurship or how we how we approach our work as small business owners or you know founders of organizations or whatever like yeah it's not going to work if you don't put everything into it but also then it still might not work and that's also not a bad thing provided you haven't done any damage to someone and you you know have assessed the risk along the way so you aren't throwing everything financially into it and you end up in a big black hole of debt Mm -hmm. um You know, a lot of the time, the losses are not huge to start off with, especially if you're in a a business that has such low overheads. If you're an online business or you're a a teaching studio or something like, um, and I know different teaching studios have different levels of overhead, especially if, you know, you go all in and get the building and all of that. But, you know, if you start out with that, that idea or that kind of mentality of if this is going to fail, I'm going to let it fail early so that, (laughs) so that my risk is minimized then you get a lot of valuable lessons out of that. And then it actually enables you to succeed in a different way further down the line. If you continue, I think the only true failure is when you stop. Mm. Mm. I like that. I like thinking of failing yeah. forward. So, oh. so it's like that. Um, I always have this visual imagery of, you know, let's say that you're in a, the last legs of a marathon or something, which I've never done. Uh, and you fall over, you know, the only way that you don't reach the end is if you stop right there. But Mm -hmm. if you, you know, scramble and like on your hands and knees and like pulling yourself up, you might get, you know, bloody along the way. You might cut yourself up. You might throw up or whatever. Like it might be a hot mess, but eventually if you keep going, you will reach the end Mm -hmm. or you will reach that target or that goal. And it doesn't matter if it's not mess, if it's not perfect and not clean or whatever, you still got there. Uh, it makes me feel it, it makes me feel bad for all of those for all of the people that we have seen so far that have just stopped mm-hmm. you know because well it's okay to stop and like take time to reevaluate mm-hmm. but again it's like that that like allowing something to just allow to be the hard stop I think is the mm-hmm. the really yeah like the sad part of it and the disheartening element and that they're the people that I'm like, just come and talk to me. Yes, please. I'll make you feel better. (laughs) We can do it together. We can figure this out. It's not, I promise you it's okay. (laughs) You're not alone. You're not alone. If anyone learns anything from this podcast, please just like know that you are not alone. And there are like so many of us out here figuring this stuff out and you're not the Mm -hmm. only person trying to do it. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) And we're all in different stages of it. And, you know, just to jump back um, about the pandemic stuff, like the pandemic has highlighted this for us all, of course, but it's also not the first time or the last time we're going to have a season in which we have to pivot and adapt as musicians. And so like, if this is the first time you've thought about 
having to diversify or having to think more broadly, just know that that is not going to be wasted in the future for you either. Like you exploring that and setting yourself up now and really digging into that, that's going to serve you for the rest of your life. Mm-hmm. And beyond music as well, like if you are, you know, or even if you're in like a position where you are, let's say a band director who has, you know, a, a job that's very clearly defined, having the ability to like understand entrepreneurial thinking and skill sets and developing these diverse level, like these diverse avenues of your career is not going to prevent you from using that in a job like that. You know, being a band director requires a lot more than standing on the podium conducting. Like there are so many other avenues that having this extra layer of knowledge can support that exploring all of this now while you either have time or while you have the motivation or while you have the absolute need to generate income because your job got cut or you know your student numbers decline like these skill sets will serve you forever regardless of what it is that you do right um you have nothing to lose exactly trying yeah no and again like even if you just have something that lasts only until the end of the pandemic and then you decide you don't want to keep it going um and you go back to other work that's not a failure just because it hasn't continued doesn't mean that it was a lost experience or a failed experience it's it's still valid and important and you know you learn through that process yes for sure like Marie Kondo it say thank you and then realize that it served that purpose for that time period and that maybe you don't need to continue that if that's the way that you feel (laughs) yes and if it doesn't bring you joy then right Maybe you can let go of it, you know? Yeah. Well, I think we're going to see so many people continuing a lot of really interesting things um, as a result of the pandemic, like when the, the world, whatever the world is going to do. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to say it's not going to go back to normal. Things aren't ever going to go back to the way they were. Like, I don't want to say that. It'll open up again. Um, yeah. Maybe that's the way to talk about it. But, you know, there are going to be things that, that change and that shift and people have will pivot and have discovered new things about themselves during this time period, which, you know, is such an exciting prospect too, because while everything is feeling really condensed and shut down now, um, because we've been limited by being in person or not, not being able to be in person, there is going to be such incredible opportunity and desire and need. And people are going to be craving the arts and culture and music that I'm so excited to see how this the next few years are going to look for, for our industry. Cause if we allow it to, I think it's going to be a real, really huge opportunity and a really exciting time of growth. That is a very positive and optimistic way to look at it. And I 100% agree. I would much mm-hmm. rather like everyone, like if we can just like stick with it and stick it out, then on the other side of this thing, I think that everything is just going to, bloom in ways that the classical music industry hasn't seen maybe ever Mm -hmm. maybe yeah well and it's hard to kind of predict what that's going to look like because Mm -hmm. again we have never lived through a global pandemic um (laughs) at least I haven't (laughs) um but yeah I mean there are going to be so many things that we just don't even know one one of the things that I was told as a high schooler was that in like 80% of the jobs in the future didn't yet exist. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as a high schooler, when I was told that, I was like, whatever, like, that doesn't make any sense. How can the world change that much? Well, that was (laughs) pre-iPhone. Yeah. So, like, thinking about everything that's come through those types of, like, devices, the way that, um, you know, just think of everything. You've got not just the technology, but every element of the technology. So the app designers, the web designers, the every part of that. Then you've got all of the... Um, like the building out of the product. So you've got all of the industry related to that. And then you've also got the applications of these things. So, you know, if the influencer market didn't exist back when I was in high school and now right. that's a whole thing. Like I look at that now and go, wow, that person, I don't know what the statistics are and how correct that person's statement of 80% of the jobs of the future didn't exist, but I can't imagine it's that far off. Yeah. And, and if I keep thinking about that and thinking about, okay, there's going to be growth here then it's not even a matter of staying the course and just holding on. It's a matter of how can I get into that? How can I prepare for that? What can I do now so that I'm at the forefront of that when, when the world is ready for it? Mm-hmm. Yes. This, okay. 
I love this conversation. Everything about it. <laughs> I hope that people feel pumped up after listening to this whenever they listen to it. <laughs> and like motivated to like get out there and like start making their stuff happen. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Totally. And we we all have such unique things to bring. So that's why I'm that's why I get really excited about this because if we again, if we go back and look at what is it that we want and what is it that like what is the we want for our lives and how can we design our lives to to look like that then that also opens up for okay so someone else has this passion about music and another element or music and whatever else and so if they're able to go I want to combine those things in my life then who knows what that's going to create yeah. I'm working okay. with someone at the moment who's like I want to I want to combine like my instrument and teaching on my instrument with coffee and oh. so like he's exploring this thing of like how can I combine those things? And I'm like, I don't know, but I'm in. Oh yeah, every musician <laughs> let's, everywhere let's is this in. Out because <laughs> this is gonna be important. <laughs> yes, for sure. <laughs> Keep us posted on whoever that is and <laughs> yeah. what they end up doing because yeah, I'm interested. Awesome. So, okay, I want to be respectful of your time today, mm -hmm. but I do have one more question for you sure. that is very important to me. <laughs> And I have a feeling I know where they're going. With this. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so, okay. Tell me about, um, making the pavlova that, um, Nancy Burt whistle called beautiful <laughs> on Instagram. I have to know. <laughs> so I, I love the British baking show. Of oh, course. same. And I love Nancy and my mm -hmm. friend Ashley and I, um, we are always texting each other like, we follow Nancy's Instagram and are always just sharing links to each other. Like, look what Nancy did. Look at this. <laughs> and I, being Australian, um, one of the things that I am most proud of is my ability to make a pavlova. Oh. And it is an art form. It, mm -hmm. <laughs> there's always a very high level of stress in the house when I'm creating a pavlova because I'm like, this is going to work or it's not. And it's not, we're not going to know until the end. And so it's like a three hour process to see whether or not it's going to work. And so we have this kind of, thing in my household and with my friends where if it's a special occasion Jess makes a pavlova and we all kind of anxiously wait to see how that's going to turn out and so this Christmas I set the challenge for myself of I'm going to make Nancy's Christmas pavlova wreath and they're all like okay <laughs> so, so I you know I dedicated the entire day to do it and I followed her directions and did all that and so I was kind of taking photos through the process and was like I'm going to share this with Nancy because I also have this thing that I do um, where I really like to see if I can get famous people to communicate with me. Uh huh. <laughs> and <laughs> it's like people that I admire or people who I'm just like, you know what? They'll never reply. Yeah. I, I'm losing nothing by tagging Taylor Swift in something, but maybe yeah. one day she'll reply <laughs> and that would be cool. But I think that came from, I, I actually read something once that was like a challenge of, you know, this professor challenged his students to see who could get the most famous person to communicate with them within a week. And I'm like, Ooh, I'm going to do that every day. Um, <laughs> because you realize that the world is much smaller than it is. Right. Um, but yeah, so kind of combining all of those things of me wanting to create literally the best pavlova of my life with also my interest in getting famous people to interact with me. Um, <laughs> I was like, I'm going to share this on face on Instagram. And I did, and I shared it through the process and, um, it turned, it was like the best pavlova I've ever made. So I was really thrilled at that. And then for Nancy to share it and she reposted it on her stories and, Oh um, my God, that was just, it was very cool. And you know, I guess one of the highlights of my cooking career. Oh yeah. <laughs> like, oh yeah. I'm, I'm like on the British baking show by proxy now. So I mean, pretty much. <laughs> wow. I mean, um, I know meringue is hard. Um, mm -hmm. I know meringue is hard. I have failed at it and, mm -hmm. but meringue is not for everyone. Like meringue is not everyone's favorite dessert, but I know that mm -hmm. like, it's definitely an Australian thing and it looked beautiful when it was done. <laughs> like you. it looked just like, just like Nancy would have done it. Oh, I went like searching for all the ingredients too, to find those little, um, like coffee straw chocolate sticks that she put in. Like mm -hmm. I went all around Austin. I was like, I need something and ended up getting like little you know, the little pocky sticks. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I was like, it's not the same, but it's not, not the same. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, it's, and I've had so much trouble making pavlovas in, in my years. There was one time that I used, I think I used 
an entire thing of 18 eggs and then sent my husband to get more because it still wasn't working. Oh, gosh. Um, like, it was just, <laughs> it was a whole day. Um, but, yeah, it's one of those things I was like, I'm going to make this work and then I'm just going to share it and see what happens. And that was super fun. That's so cool. Okay, I just, I came up with one more question for you mm-hmm. in my head just because you're Australian and I have you on the show right now. And I <laughs> love flat whites. Mm-hmm. Do you like flat whites? Yeah, but I don't know why they charge more money for a flat white here than they do for a latte. It's literally easier it's to the make same a flat exact. white than a latte. Yeah. I don't know why I, either. <laughs> it, it was the first time we did it, actually, uh, went to a Starbucks because they were selling them. And they charged us more for it. And, like, again, like, we were, I think my husband and I were doing it together. And we are just like, but why is this more expensive when it doesn't take any more effort and it's actually way easier to do. And they're like, I guess it's just because it's fancier. It's like, it's, it's super not. It's I know. just coffee and milk. Yeah. <laughs> it's literally just because it's, it's different than a latte mm-hmm. and Starbucks just wants to keep making money right. off of well, unsuspecting people. The latte in Australia is usually more expensive than a flat white. So oh, I'm always really? like, Oh, I'm going to get a latte. I'm fancy today. And people here are like, I'm going to get a flat white. I'm fancy today. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. All right, I had to ask. I, I'm glad that you weren't yep. offended by either of those things. No, I was just, I was waiting for you to be like, you're Australian. Do you know this Australian? That's the more oh, no. question. <laughs> <laughs> like, yes, I know all 29 million Australians. Oh, no, I would never, I would never <laughs> do one of those. But I would ask you about meringues and flat whites. It's fine. I'm okay. into that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. Well, um, just before I let you go, please uh, tell the people where they can find you online if they want to follow your work or get in touch for some coaching. Yeah, sure. So my website is jessvoitpage.com and I will make sure that um, it's J-E-S-S-V-O-I-G-T-P-A-G-E.com. Mm-hmm. Um, I know that, again, my accent kind of gets in the way sometimes, but um, so you can find me there. I've got a lot of blog posts and things up there, also a contact form, and I do open different coaching packages like group programs and one-on-one programs throughout the year. So jumping on my mailing list, mailing list while there is going to be the best way to stay in touch with me. Um, but I also am doing a YouTube series at the moment, my three minute Thursdays, I've been experimenting with technology and having a bit of fun with posting regularly on YouTube. And that's been something that I've really enjoyed. So I'm going to keep doing that. So if you're wanting to just get more general information about entrepreneurship and business building, um, you know, small business ownership or anything like that for musicians, that's the focus of, of the three minute Thursday videos over on my YouTube account. And I believe because I have over a hundred subscribers, I was able to set my account. So it's like youtube.com slash Jess Voigt page. I believe is how oh, you get there. Nice. I have been watching those. Those have been very useful, like little bite-sized tidbits of information. Mm-hmm. I like those. Everyone should go watch those. I mean, it's a challenge to get, to keep them under three minutes, which yeah. I don't succeed often with, but you know, it's three ish minutes. So yeah, <laughs> that's what I'm going with. You can also get to meet my cats that way too. Cause they like to appear every now and then. <laughs> And then you're also on Instagram. Yes. Yeah. Instagram, Facebook, Pinterest at, you know, Jess Voigt page for all of those as well. You're on Pinterest too? I am. And oh. I got 10,000 views this month. It's crazy. On Pinterest? Yeah. Holy crap. Okay. I'm going to go follow you on <laughs> Pinterest now too. I didn't I even like know you were there. I have 16 followers, but you know, getting lots of views, which is fun. Wow. Cool. Good for you. Mm-hmm. I didn't even know that like musicians were like on Pinterest, like, doing things like I know like some there's some like music ed related stuff that's on Mm -hmm. Pinterest but I didn't know that it's just I mean it's not something I've spent a lot of time on I'm just sharing links to my videos on there but um Mm -hmm. you know I know that there are a lot of people that love using Pinterest so it's just kind of another another way to share my content um there's a whole bunch of things like if you want to get into all of the social media different types of things like you can do anything and there are so many strategies for all of it but um, there's, you have to work at them. So mm-hmm. my, my Pinterest strategy is post it and see what happens, which is not yeah. a strategy. <laughs> <laughs> but at least it's there. And yeah. now everyone knows about the untapped market that is Pinterest. So there you go. <laughs> that's that's probably the biggest tip that you have for today. Go put your stuff on Pinterest. <laughs> With a strategy in mind. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Well, thank you so much again for your time, Jess. I really appreciate it. I think that this time was super valuable, and I hope that everyone listening got a lot of good stuff out of it. 
Yeah, I hope so too. And I love to hear from everyone. So, you know, if you jump on, on that mailing list or even just send me an email, I will respond because I love chatting with people about this stuff. So thank you for having me. Yeah, of course. This was fun. We'll have to have you again sometime. Yeah. Love yeah. it. We can talk about how three minute Thursdays can be filmed. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the process of filming on YouTube, because that's a whole thing, but three ish yeah. minutes probably takes minutes. a lot longer than that to actually do all of the filming. And oh that my gosh. <laughs> There's a lot of outtakes that I should share one day. You should. Yeah, just put together a whole outtake reel. I would watch it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thanks again, Jess. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you. You too. Bye, Bye everyone. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry, but I'm not sorry. I love Jess's little baby Australian accent, and I love Great British Bake Off, and I love Flat Whites. If you don't know what a flat white is, it's like, it's basically, I was literally about to say a fancy latte. That's literally what I was about to say. <laughs> um, but they do, you can get a flat white at any coffee shop. I highly suggest that you try it. It's like a really nice, thick latte. That's, that's how I would describe it. So I hope that you got as much out of that conversation as I did. And I hope that you feel fired up to get out there and start making some moves in your career right now. Remember those three things that Jess said that you should do like now in order to really get your business moving down that yellow brick road is thing number one sit down and think about what you want to do and why. Get real on the why about it. Thing number two, think about what you need to do in order to get there. The needs, the things that you can foresee immediately that would need to happen in order to accomplish that goal. And then thing number three, just get started. Don't wait till it's ready. Start before you're ready get started. I can't agree more. I also want to take one moment to remind you again about Patreon. Uh, anywhere we've got $5, $10 and $20 per month. If you have the available funds, I really appreciate it. Um, if you could work it into your budget, which is a very cheesy segue into our next episode next week is going to be all about budgeting for beginners and some things that you should be budgeting for as a musician and to overall lose this mindset of being a starving artist you don't need to be a starving artist in order to be a um an artist yeah you don't need to starve you don't need to go through that starving phase there's no reason why you should <laughs> so we're going to talk about that next week just you and i Okie dokie. So um, make sure that you rate, review, and subscribe and tell a friend. And make sure that you join the Unclassical Musicians Facebook page. I will see you next time. Bye. Bye.